I was born and brought up in Montgomeryshire and uh, born just outside a little village called Sanvi Hangel and Winva. And I went to a church in Wales school, so we had lots of regular scripture every morning. And I, my mother was well versed in the scriptures, so I had an awful lot of scripture knowledge. And then I went to Aberystwyth to do my degree, and it was there I met a real Christians who had a personal relationship with the Lord. And uh, to cut a long story short, this uh, missionary lady called um, Mrs. Fraser, Roxy Fraser, the wife, the widow of J.O. Fraser of Lisoland, was speaking in Aberystwyth. And then um, she made it quite clear in, in talking to her when I said, yes, I think the Sermon on the Mount is such a wonderful ideal. And then she gradually and quietly told me, don't you think you're putting the cart before the horse? And she explained to me uh, in a very real, simple way, did I understand that I was a sinner and that the Lord Jesus Christ had come to be my saviour? I knew all the scriptures about that because I was so used to hearing in Welsh that this is a true saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. But to me it was a nice quote from scripture. But that night, would you believe it, after this meeting on the prom in Aberystwyth, that's when the transaction took place that I was able to confess clearly I'm a sinner and Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in you and accept you as my Saviour and Lord. And that's how it all started. How old are you? I was um, 19, I think, then, yes. And what was your Christian life like before, prior to marriage? Well, then I proceeded in Aberystwyth to do my degree and appreciated greatly the Christian Union and the meetings there. And also in a hall of residence, uh, there were one or two Christians, but the Lord was gracious and saved um, a bunch of us. And we would try and meet uh, to have a short Bible study before high tea every Wednesday, I remember. And I suppose, well, it was almost like the blind leading the blind, but I remember having a go at Gal Galatians. And then um, we enjoyed, ah yes, the early morning prayer meetings when we would tear along the prom to be in the German room and there we would meet for a brief time of prayer uh, before going to nine o'clock lectures. And that was excellent discipline because before that I would make sure I was up early enough to read and pray on my own in the bedroom then. There were several flights of stairs. You had to go from the top where you were, perhaps down two flights, down to the basement to have your breakfast, hurry up from there and still be in the German room by half past eight. And that was lovely to meet with the Christians there. And um, then the, every uh, Saturday evening we had Bible studies and we would, uh, that was very helpful, the whole of the Christian Union. So I feel I owe an awful lot to the the regular discipline and the help in these meetings. And when I went back home to Montgomery, so I was very much on my own uh, in the chapels there. Yes. And what was your what was your spiritual experience at that time? Um... I was brought up as an Anglican, and then I was confirmed in the Anglican Church. But gradually, um, even in the sixth form, I'd started going in the other direction, a mile in the other direction, to go to the uh, Welsh-speaking congregational chapel. And I can remember in the sixth one before I was converted, um, the, the pattern there was three services every Sunday. One service would be the Sunday school, all-age Sunday school. Another service would be a sermon. And another service would be prayer meeting. And it, for the prayer meeting, it wasn't like we normally have in our churches these days. It, you were called out by invitation to pray one at a time. And all of a sudden, one morning, and I was still in the sixth form, the senior um, uh, man said, Cainwen, would you like to come forward? And I thought, all right, I've got to choose a hymn, a reading, a prayer. We got that far, and all of a sudden, I turned to him in the corner and said, do you want me to pray? Whispered, and all of a sudden he said, yes, if you can. 
and I went on my knees in the big seat. I've no re recollection of what I said, but I, I, that was a strange experience, and to me it was real at the time. That was as far as I could go. But after I was converted, I had opportunities then. Believe it or not, I was asked to prepare a message and take a service because a group of farmers got together and said, something has happened to you, hasn't it? And I felt in my heart a burning desire. I loved all these people as I loved my own family and I loved my nation, but I loved the people around me in Montgomery, these gentle, kind, lovely people who would do anything to help one another. They knew what self-sacrificing, they knew how to respect and honour each other. And so they actually asked me to prepare a message. And the Sunday came when I was asked to take a service in one chapel a long way away by 10 o'clock, to take another one in the afternoon in a place called Pont Roberts, and to take the evening service in our own little chapel. And um, it was a case of cycling everywhere, up hills and down tails, and no three speed even on the bike. <laughs> So, yeah, they were interesting days, but you felt absolutely on fire for the Lord. And I forgot to say, um, in the early 50s, they had the very first Welsh-speaking Welsh conference, um, and we called it Can Had Leather Kilch Ground. Everything was centred around the little evangelical magazine of Wales, and it was in Bala, and I was invited to go there. It was the other side of the Berwyn Mountain from us, and it was there that I had my first real love for the Word. And then they went home, I couldn't read the Bible often enough or en enough. And, um, well, it meant so much to me. And Romans was my first real love. How much I understood, I, I don't know, but it was very precious to me. And what um, gospel opportunities came your way through those well, times? Yeah, ample then, um, uh, as well as being asked to take a service, the trouble was that other people would hear and probably other chapels thought, well, this young girl going around, it was unheard of that a woman should stand in front and say anything in any of the chapels. And I found myself being given opportunities here, there and everywhere. And people would come then from lots of um, distances in their cars to listen. And I can remember little chapels being crowded and full, cars piled up outside. And then no sooner would you see uh, uh, tears trickling down their faces. All I can say that God, the Lord was real, so real to me, that all fear and shyness was taken away. All I wanted to do was explain to them that um, what the Lord had done for us as sinners and how much it had cost him. And, uh, oh, I remember seeing so vividly, I am the way, the truth and the life. And I just explain, you know, the little bridge and so on. So, so, you know, the bridge is there for us. We are on this side as sinners. God is there in his love, reaching out to us. And he says, come, and this is the way, mm. and it's, and he is the only way. And that's all I seem to want to say to people. And then I was given an opportunity, would I do the local postman's round one summer? It happened two summers. I walked miles. You had to walk a mile into the village before you sorted the letters. You went from farm to farm. I always had my New Testament with me. And again, the farmers, people around would say, I've been thinking about so and so, what do you think, or what about such a hymn? And I, a, a group of uh, roadmen were working, and they said, what do you understand by the kingdom of God? I was so young in everything, but you, oh, this is how it was at that time. I feel, uh, looking back, well, God was very real. What was the um, kind of spiritual temperature of the, of the area? You know, um, I, were they religious? Re yes, r religious, very respectful to God out there, very aware of God. People wouldn't cut their hay on the Sunday. But uh, not long before I got married, there was one farmer, and because Sundays were so still and quiet, you could hear him cutting the hay. And people say, well, in the market apparently the following day, 
did you realize that so and so so and so was in the hay uh, yesterday on the Sunday and that to them they were afraid to do it there was that fear of God I think mm. and then some of the older people would use the expression the older farmers I was if you said them well how are you today it was a little phrase called in Welsh testing diolch my text is one of thanksgiving and that's been with me then all my life I feel waking up in the morning I've got a test in diolch my test in today is one of thanksgiving Ebenezer the Lord has helped me thus far and uh, there was that atmosphere uh, almost an awareness of the being of God but not a personal relationship Bible knowledge mm. and that's the value of Sunday school they had been drilled in the scriptures but it was a case of knowing about we oh yes and it was normal to learn chunks of scripture and you had these little competitive meetings like a mini Eisteddfodau and you had those in the chapels and it was normal for a group of men to um, recite to the, together Cyd Adroth and it would be chunks of scripture so oh uh, uh, John 15 a portion of John 15 John 17 um, well the uh, Gwynwadai the Beatitudes it was normal and everybody knew the Ten Commandments off by heart there was yes it was still tradition to learn scripture and learning hymns off by heart people would would have the hymn books more for the tunes so they could sing in tune and it was harmony everywhere for four parts always um, that um, you you often would know the words off by heart yes sounds like a classic kind of Christian culture yeah um, where people grow up in that and um, but obviously they grew up in it without life initially and so you have the externals um, and I guess what they saw in you was spiritual reality, different I, to what they had. Well, and so different from anybody else. I was very different in that um, my mother had, uh, had uh, agreed with our normal rector, and he was a great encouragement to me, um, that if I passed my exams, I could stay on in school. If I passed scholarship, pass whatever, if I passed, then I could go on to university and study. And no one else did that. The girls, it was normal to leave school at 14 or whatever and work at home or work at somebody else's farm. So I, I was on my own in that respect and different. And of course, I had this tremendous experience of being saved and being sure of my saviour and uh, wanting to, and the opportunity was given me. I didn't seek it. I never asked. It, it, things came my way. I felt I was always pushed into things or invited in things. Never ever did I seek an opportunity. And then from one chapel to another, quite honestly, I must have done a couple of dozen in the end. And, um, and that's how it was. Opportunities was given because and they just accepted that's looking back I'm so surprised to have a female in the oh I can remember this is how courteous the Montgomeryshire people men would be um, this um, they'd arrange that I would have a companion who knew where the chapels were that very first Sunday and she came on a bike and we would meet at a certain crossroads and Lynette said to me oh just one request they suggested that um, when you've prepared your message and you go to give you won't stand in the pulpit will you will just stand by the little lectern in the big seat i said i've already made up my mind i said i wouldn't dare climb up the pulpit steps i'll just um, do the best i can to explain that tells you guilithra we call it it's a gentle humility mm. that characterizes those people in that area and when I pray now uh, through the fruit of the Spirit, I do pray to be gentle because in my own life I lack that. I tend to say, well, do it, pull yourself together, do it. And I lack that gentleness that you know, our Lord is gentle, isn't he? Mm. And uh, I feel I've got so much to learn in um, understanding what his requirements are of us as our Lord. You know, I've always been quite clear that he is my saviour and my lord. 
I look back towards Calvary and I'm grateful for all he has done, but am I grateful enough to uh, understand and appreciate him as my Lord mm. and to possess me utterly and all oh, to be like him. That's what I would like to be. It's amazing how gentle he is when you consider who he is. And we can be so ungentle and we're, who are we in Ex comparison to him exactly. and his might exactly. and his holiness. Amazing. No difficulty ever in saying nothing in my hand I bring, nothing of which to boast, no pedigree, nothing, nothing to offer him at all. I've never had a problem with that. And yet I can't understand how subtle self is and getting in your pride to make us proud when we've nothing at all. But but he understands us, that's what I'm grateful. Mm. That somebody said to me years ago, okay, when um, he knows your heart, it's a shock to you to find out how sinful you are. He knows what we're made of and he does remember we are dust. The amazing thing that he loves us so perfectly despite all that. And he's so very patient, really patient with us. But on the other hand, I don't want to trade on his gentle patience. I would love to be what he wants me to be. Yes, yes. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Trading. Yeah, you don't want that. Um, outside of spe speaking and talks and um, in terms of your everyday life at that time, um, how did that kind of, that desire, that recognition that you were under new management and that the Lord was your, your all in that sense, just in practical everyday things, yes. on your own, how did that manifest itself? Ah, right. Well, the discipline as a student, you know, um, the trouble was that I did have lots of interests. I've always enjoyed singing and you'd win prizes and so on. So you got involved in singing and in the university choir and things. And then in the Welsh society you'd get involved in preparing programmes and things like that. So I had to be careful with lots of interests that the Lord wasn't an interest amongst other interests. And therefore uh, to get up early and to be in the Word, to be in the Scriptures and to get something that would almost burn itself into me um, for the day. And, and needed his strength uh, to th then having gone home. My desire was to get up earlier to make life easier for my parents. I can remember that quite distinctly. And to say, well, whatever I can do, is it cleaning the cow shed or learning to milk a bit better, make butter, uh, bake, do whatever, clean the house, whatever, and uh, be available to do anything for people. And you had lots of opportunities like that. And then that helped me by the time we were married, um, which uh, was a different sort of life altogether. Which leads me on to my next question. Um, what was it like being the minister's <laughs> wife and yeah. what can you tell us about, um, in brief, about Derek's ministry at that time? Right. Well, dare I say, um, perhaps I would never have found myself in that situation and be willing to be married to a minister if it hadn't been for Philippians. Philippians is my, well, favourite epistle really. And through Philippians chapter 3, um, the Lord met with me and was I willing to give up certain things and to really, really be all out for the Lord. And it was through that verse, well, if for me it was real to count all things as worthless then for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. After that it didn't matter, I remember saying whatever you want me to do and I went to, we had a Welsh conference in Borth, that was a great help. Then I went once or twice to Swanwick where you had a conference for all uh, students all over um, Britain and I can remember singing some, some chorus of a hymn who, who will go, salvation storytelling, looking to Jesus and counting not the cost. That night was real to me. Yes, I am willing. I am willing. So eventually, to cut a long story short, I was getting my degree, my BA, and Derek was doing postgraduate, he was doing BD. And the system was in those days that they would confer extra 
degrees like that, BDs, MSEs, whatever, in one of the four university branches. So he came to Aberystwyth. It so happened the year I had my BA. I was working in a guest house and the lady at the guest house had had an SOS from a minister who used to be in Aberystwyth called Russell Jones and asking could you possibly give a be night's rest, uh, bed to this student, he's coming for his BD. She was so busy she said will you write three or four letters for me. By the way write a quick note to say yes we'll have that student called Derek Swan for a night and uh, that's the first time I'd ever met him. And the, the girls would often say, oh, so-and-so, so and that's so, so, Derek Swan from Cardiff. You know him? No, I said, I've never met him, no. And his name had come up. No, I said, I've never seen that man, no. Anyway, we met that day, and the first conversation I remember was, what are you reading at the moment? I said, well, I'm in the middle of reading uh, Bishop Ryle on holiness. All right, we can talk about that. He went away, and that was it. Months later, he came to Aberystwyth to accompany the late John Capper, who was speaking at an open students' meeting. He obviously came in the hope that he would see this girl again, because he felt in his heart one day, she's the one for me. I had no idea. And that, that particular night in Aber, I remember I was busy preparing um, for an essay and I'd borrowed books out of the library and I could ill afford the time to go to that meeting and I was nearly thinking I'm not going, I've got to get on um, getting this um, essay together. In the end I went and I was sitting around, I turned around and I saw, I thought I've seen that smile somewhere before and then this same gentleman came on to me at the end and he said I remember meeting you etc etc. And then he, he insisted that he needed a breath of fresh air. Would he walk along the prom? And again, he said, are you reading anything in particular? What are you doing? Well, it so happens, I said, I'm in the middle of uh, going through a certain hymn writer's hymns because I've been asked to give a paper somewhere tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow evening on this um, hymn writer called Anne Griffiths who happens to come. She was born and brought up in my home. Area. Oh, I said, he said, I've heard of her. Tell me more. Well, we didn't end the conversation. I said, I've really got to go in now. Um, he said, well, I, I'd like to meet you again. Perhaps I can write to you. That's how it all started. So uh, from there on, uh, I was given a post in Cardiff. We met again and uh, we got married eventually in 1959. And um, it, first of all, we were in the Cumbran area, Pont Newydd. And then in 1962, Derek had a call to go to Ashford, Middlesex, which in the Greater London area near the Heathrow and not far from Windsor, that area. And um, we were there for nearly 30 years. And uh, this was very much of giving wholeheartedly. By now we had a baby. Our baby was four weeks old when we moved to Ashford. So I was a mum for the first time and I was in a completely English environment, but that never troubled me at all. And um, I suppose I would say I, I really enjoyed it very much, I really did. It was hard very often, but we never stopped to think, are we happy? We're, we're here by God's appointment. And we were sure of that. It took us a long time, it took Derek a long time and together a long time before saying yes to Ashford. Because in Wales people say, you've got to live, you've got to stay in Wales, we need you here. And then you'd have other people say, no, the world is God's parish, you go wherever he, he leads you. Mm. And Derek felt very much it had a confirmation from scripture as well. And it um, subsequently, especially in the early years, there was ample confirmation that we were in the right place for certain very definite reasons. Do you have um, particular memories that stick out of the Lord's working during those 30 years? Yes, yes. Initially, um, we belonged to, or the church belonged to, the Congregational Union of England and Wales. And uh, they had their annual uh, big meetings every May, the May meetings, the May assembly. And along came in the early 60s this pamphlet, a deep a sizable pamphlet and somewhere you had to agree that the Bible contains error. Derek had been brought up as a liberal and he said to me before the crucial meeting came, 
I've come from there, I now am committed completely to the infallibility and the inerrancy of Scripture. And that was his one big thing that he was sure of. And that was what he was used a lot among students. Whenever we speak, I remember him being asked to do a series more than once, the infallibility and the inerrancy of Scripture to get people to understand. And he had got a well-stocked mind and a well-disciplined mind. So, Anyway, in the end, uh, he was used in our own church in Ashford and in five churches in the locality. He was asked by the other ministers to come and explain all this. So when the crucial church meeting came in our church and he said, you will stand by me, won't you, if all the church is against me, because I cannot sign this document. And the, this was a special church meeting in which I explained. And everybody saw and said, we believe the Bible is the word of God. We believe, we, we agree with you, Mr. Swan. We cannot enter into it and sign this. So when the time came, we gradually withdrew from the Congregational Union of England and Wales. Believe it or not, after Derek made that stand, he was led to do a series from Colossians. Lots of people were saved and the church began to be full up and you had to be there reasonably early and they would carry chairs from everywhere and put them down the aisles and so on. And uh, that was what I would call, would you call it a purple patch? And then you would expect people to come to the door and say, I've been thinking about what you said. I, I can't quite see it. My wife says so and so, so and so, and I'm sure she's right, but I can't see it. Can you come and explain it to me? And I can remember one incident very especially when this man, he was a scientist, Dr. So-and-so, and he'd been on, put on a three-day week in whatever firm he worked for. And he said, look, Mr. Swan, do you think you and your wife could come to our house by nine o'clock um, tomorrow morning, Monday? I've got some questions to ask you. And bit by bit, he came from darkness to light, from death to life. And I remember the change in him, the joy. Instead, he started coming out of respect and love for his wife. By now, they had one baby. And he would sit in the very back, come in at the last minute and disappear. Bit by bit, he came to sit nearer. Well, now he was saved. He was at one with his wife. He was full of peace and joy. And he came on his way home from wherever he worked one day. He said, Mr. Swan, no, I'm not coming in. I'm not coming to disturb you. But is there anything at, at all I can do in church? Something out of sight? And Derek said, well, Andrew, he said, I can only think of one thing. We're short of people to clean the men's toilets. That'll do me, he said. So unbeknown to anyone else, this extremely well-qualified man would come prepared and do a thorough job of cleaning the toilets. Now things like that um, warm your heart somehow when you remember the change like that. Mm. Yes. There were lots of difficulties, lots of very painful periods, lots of times when we were out of our depth with different problems that people had. But then you were cast back on the Lord. I don't know what the answer is, but you are the Lord God of all wisdom. And sections of the scriptures became vitally important to us. And I remember in one church meeting when things were tense and all I could do was open in front of me and go over the wisdom that is from above is first peaceable and easily to be entreated. And all of a sudden Derek called that church meeting where things were a bit difficult stop everybody we've got to stop mm. we're in the presence of god mm. there was a still and he said before we do anything else we're quiet you know let's try and remember who he is we're in his presence and he prayed mm. there was a stillness and after that it was decided to have a side time of prayer before every church meeting and um yeah we did see calming of storms like that we saw transformations of lives you had all sorts of problems, and on the women's side, I, young wives every Wednesday, about 20, 30 usually there, we saw conversions there. Well, that was the lovely thing there. When I first went there, they wanted uh, to have cookery demonstrations, 
and I said look the gas board I thought I haven't given up everything just to have cookery demonstrations and I didn't think things like that were quite right mm. and there were only about five or six going and in the end I felt I was a bit of a nuisance because I had this young baby and, the, and I said do you think we'll close for the summer and uh, pray about it all I was quite nervous and um, I prayed it, I ate it, I thought it, what can I do with these young women? Uh, and there are more young women because we had schools in the area. Prayed. I wrote down what I thought, that we should put it on spiritual lines and we should have a Bible study at least once a month. And then the time came and uh, they, uh, they said, right, t shall we pool our resources? And they said, you go first. And I can remember shaking and saying, well, this is what I've thought. And they said, oh, there's no need for any of us to say anything. We'll restart the way you suggest in September. And we were 18 at that first meeting. And it was lovely after that. We saw girl women being converted. And outside their school gates, they would arrange to go earlier so they could look out for who was lonely, you know. And I can remember there was this girl of Catholic background and she was going through a period of depression and uncertainty. And there was this delightful rather quietly spoken Christian called Vera and Vera had said to Iris would you like to come to coffee or I'd love to and afterwards Iris could say every day I was thinking will she ask me has she remembered the day came when she did go to this Vera Vera brought her Iris was saved and it happened like that you could see a pattern looking back every so often we'd look around we were all saved and before I had time to say we should all be reaching out, all of a sudden that's how they felt. So we had a little extra prayer meeting in Vera's house. We had another extra meeting, prayer meeting in Pam's house for about half an hour on the day of the young wives. And if you went in a bit late, they were all kneeling down. All you saw would be soles of feet. And they were all praying. And they would somehow reach, and more people would come in and they would be saved. It didn't go on forever and ever. That's why I call them my purple patches. Mm. On Thursday, we had older ladies, more, more stayed. We had a speaker every week, but I made sure I was there beforehand. There'd be about 50 of them to make sure they had a warm handshake. And in case some of them, if they had to catch a train or something, they would escape and I wouldn't see them. So I would try then when I went home, always made notes to try and remember people's circumstances and things, you know. And God had blessed me with a good memory, which was a help. When well, Indian wives, I started thinking they ought to read, they ought to read, because they weren't used to reading Christian books. So I had a case at home, I'd fill it from what I could take and take it over every Wednesday. And in the only way I knew, they had an exercise book when they borrowed it. Then every so often we'd have a book afternoon with a little review, what, why they'd read it, how they'd found it helpful, and could they all participate in the, in the experiences. And uh, we found things like that. I remember one book that was greatly used was, I think it was called At Any Cost about this uh, missionary couple and um, th their first term of office and she was expecting their first be baby and he was shot uh, shot and that was a uh, that was a real blessing to them all yes there were times like that that were really worth worth everything yes and then i we used to have young people in our home every other Sunday night for years, in years this went on. And they used to call it the manse. And they, they used to go, there's a manse tonight, isn't there? Oh, there's no manse tonight. No, I said it's every other Sunday night. And you'd have about 36 or 40 of them. We had some sliding doors. You sl and then you prepared, they were everywhere. They were everywhere. And Derek had two rules. And he decided, right, um, have you thought, have you got a problem? Is there something troubling you? Have you talked to each other about it? Have you tried to th thrash it out in your own minds? We'll, we'll discuss that one problem and then together, he said, we will try and get the answer from scriptures. And I can remember one or two of the boys now saying, Oh, Mr. Swan, why don't you just tell us the answer? <laughs> He's had enough. And we used to try and make sure 
we tried to make sure they all left by half past nine because as an old teacher I thought Monday morning is important you need to be alert and wide awake for school you know they were mostly now going into the sixth form so they knew and then they always had tea or coffee or cold and we went through through fashions everybody wanted a hot drink no then we had a fashion everybody wanted a cold but those were the rules and would you believe it over the years even now years later I, I get helpful comments in Christmas cards. Um, those Sunday nights at the manse with Mr. Swan helped us that we've got to think biblically. Hmm. And I can remember one of the deacons because we were like a transit camp. People would come to our area, their jobs brought them for a while, and then they would be there for a while, they'd move on. And this man had come from Kent somewhere. He, very well versed in scripture, lovely man, became very close friend years later. Years. Well, he said to me one day, listening to your husband, I've decided I've got to rethink the way I think. Because he starts with the Bible, with, with God, when you explain, he ends with God, and it's all God in the middle. So that was his summing up of his introduction, as it were, to Derek's style of preaching. So... Yes, there were, there were tears, there was pain, there was difficulty, and there's sacrifice, isn't there? Mm. But it didn't matter in the light of Calvary. That's what we found a great help when you were hurt and you had nasty letters. I had my first vitriolic nasty letters the first Saturday. I, I think we slept there about four nights and I had this brand new baby. I didn't know the lady who written it and she obviously had a grudge against God and his people and thought, I'll aim it at her, you know. Mm. And uh, you did get things like that. And then all of a sudden we thought to each other, well, in the light of Calvary, mm. what did they do to our Lord? Mm. And he went through all that for me. Surely this is nothing. This is nothing. And he just gave you the strength and the encouragement and the, the energising experience that you get from being in the Word and being cast entirely on him. You have nothing. And you go on your knees and you cry out. And uh, oh, one of my favourite texts on a Sunday night when I was so tired. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And I used to say, Lord, you are there. I am here. I can't even bridge the gap with any shred of faith. But he always did it. And those Sunday nights when we would be so, so tired, seeing the last ones going through the gate, and Derek would say to me, oh, Darling, has it all been worthwhile? And you felt again as if you got new strength, new energy, new heart to go on, you know. The Lord is so faithful beyond all that we can ever hope for. He, he He's able to supply all our needs. And I really believe that. And that's how I rely on him now. Which brings us to the present day. Um, so after the 30 years in London? Yes. What happened then? You come here? Yes, that's right. Uh, Derek was uh, not very well and he knew he had to finish. So he came here before lots of people retire at 65 he came but then through EFCC Evangelical Fellowship of Christian uh, Christians EFCC committee he was asked by them then to do workshops for them and to go throughout the country and looking back he should have had a good rest first but he got involved in that and then he was quite involved in the prayer conference that used to go on every March and then he loved going to the, no that was a historical day in March, they, they, he loved going with the ministers and they still go, go every November to um, Matlock Bath in Derbyshire for a prayer conference and Derek really loved that, he really did. So, uh, a, a close involvement with the FCC. Uh, yes, the emphasis on being evangelical first and congregational. He was congregational uh, uh, type of government by persuasion himself, um, but e evangelical first. So he was involved in a lot of that, and he was invited to preach and so on. 
then I had to get involved here in teaching Welsh titles because bills had to be paid. And um, then Derek was taken ill and he suffered quite a lot for many years without us realising that probably it was the cancer. He had some operations and um, prostate uh, problems, which lots of men have, it wasn't cancer in that, but eventually it was, and then he eventually uh, was called home mm. in uh, 2007, and I've been on my own since then. And in a couple of year, a day, a couple of months, I will be 86. But um, well, I'm still here, and the Lord knows why. <laughs> In Heath Evangelical Church. I cannot, yes, I worship in Heath Evangelical Church. I'm not able to get to the Welsh speaking Welsh Church anymore at all, so I'm entirely in Heath and and appreciate the fellowship there. And uh, well, got to know so many lovely people. You see God's grace at work, and just at the right time and in the right way, I just so appreciate the fellowship there especially amongst the women on a wednesday morning i have to say yes that's where i am and i cannot i don't know how to underline the faithfulness of god and from even from when i wasn't converted there were texts that seemed to mean something to me he will not break the bruised reed i knew it in welsh neither a god sent a sick and we lived in the country area and i knew what reeds were and I knew what a broken reed was, and I wouldn't look at it twice. And I think something as worthless and as insignificant, and there were plenty of them in a marshy area. But to think that he won't even break the bruised reed. I didn't know much about neither fifthly in a muggy, we won't quench the smoke and flax. But this, this picture, and I feel sometimes that's where I'm at, but I know he's so tender. And I've often had cause to use his detailed care of us. And he is able to supply all our needs. Oh, I'm coming back to Philippians. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Faithful, kind, real, never failing. And I do try at the beginning of every day to remember something that Dr. Lloyd-Jones said to us years ago to remind ourselves not just who we are but who he is in the morning and Derek and I would always get up early go our separate ways to read and pray uh, before anything else happened and the children were brought up understanding that you know and um, this is how I am now trying to remember I usually talk to him in Welsh now um, that all powerful you're present everywhere you know everything. You are Almighty God. You have the answer to every problem. You are. You are my reason for being here. And then I ask, will you give me grace today? Give me that grace I need to just live for you. And that's uh, as simple as that's the way I am. By the end of the day, mind, having rehearsed before him in the morning the fruit of the Spirit, then I have to say I am sorry I've forgotten about a lot of it during the day and I'm grateful that he's able and willing to forgive us and to cleanse us. His blood is precious and he shed his precious blood for the remission, for the cleansing of our sins. I'm so glad that he is who he is and I'm never afraid. I'm glad to be in his company and I'm so grateful so grateful for all his mercies. One last question. Um, Wales today is a very different place to the place you described when you were a young, a young lady. What are your thoughts, if that's the right question? As Looking you... back, I think um, that something happened to quite a lot of us who absolutely had nothing and we were saved knowing that he was everything to us and that then we just wanted to 
be the best we could for him somehow. That's, yes, the best I can be. I can remember being confronted with things like that. And I think we were generally like that. And uh, of course, we, we didn't have much money. It was just after the war. Uh, it was it was a case of saving up hard if you wanted to go to a conference and we were told of instances when when fellows would sell the most precious thing they had one in one case like a tennis racket i this but even willing to sell your tennis racket in order to get to a conference that's how much it mattered this thirst for knowledge you wanted to learn and every conference you went to you expected to have windows open and to be refreshed and to learn and you also expected that God would meet with you personally and you'd have a fresh challenge and fresh energy and um, that that's how it was I think then looking back I, I wasn't alone this is how we were and I remember being in in one conference very specially in uh, Carnarvon I think it was and a group of girls coming together can we find an empty chapel so we can go and pray together before the next meeting um, today well I don't know it's very different for young people today remember we lived in a much more silent world mm. not everybody had phones mm. well even getting married we didn't have phones in our homes you had to run to the kiosk and have enough money and press button a and press, press button b to dis to um, discuss any arrangements for things well now not only is there a phone in every house people have their own private phones and on those phones there's access to so much more that can be helpful but can be distracting I think. Mm. There's far more distraction, there's far more noise generally speaking and because there's money people are able to go out to meals more it was unheard of. You saved hard to be able to afford a cup of coffee, not every week or anything but it, 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 things were very different so I'm not blaming, it's a different culture, it's a different... Um, I don't know if people have enough time these days to be quiet, to be still mm -hmm. and know that I am God. And you can put the even I am God, I am God, I am God. And I used to hope that no matter what my children would understand, I hoped that afterwards they would have that impression of knowing that God is God. Now that's something I would like to see permeating through. And this answerability, this accountability to God, my Saviour and my Lord. Perhaps I harp on about that a bit but to me that is crucial that you understand mm. he's both my saviour and my lord and my utter accountability for everything you pray about your career your choice of friends your leisure at time activity oh yes and steward we're stewards of everything time talent money possessions dear me Gone are the days when a fellow could afford perhaps one shirt with two spare collars to make for some variety. Well now there is money, there is disposable income, isn't there, available. And I pray much for young families where in order to pay the mortgage and to contribute to the common purse, it's necessary for mums to go out to work. That is an area of uh, prayerful interest for me that instead of criticizing people, why don't they come, why don't they? No, no, no. People are under tremendous pressure and stress, mm -hmm. very often to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the children and think, I pray for the parents that they will be able to be calm and consistent. It's very difficult to be consistent in our behavior, even before you're married and you've only got to think, to think of. But I do think of young families to be able to be consistent, to discipline, to teach and to train, but to have that right balance of um, regular discipline, perhaps harshness or severity or seriousness, but to have it with kindness and love um, Derek was very good like that and uh, those are some of the things I, I'm concerned about perhaps 
I would, I would, I think, like to see a very definite emphasis that when conferences are arranged, the the, um, the reality of having the God as our Lord and my Saviour, and this living for Him, every department of our lives, His, His, His. We pray that God will revive us. I think that's what we need. We need, we can't work it up ourselves that we will be revived in our um, acceptable, in our, in our understanding of what he's done, in our sheer love and dedication to him, that we need to be renewed and revived. And we're so dependent on him that we don't do things in his own strength, but that we come back my grace is sufficient for you, but we do need the grace, that all-sufficient grace, to live to please him. I can't pontificate about the state of churches or Wales. Today I'm more confined to barracks anyway. But uh, that would be my prayer for the reality of the presence and understanding the ownership of God, that he owns us, he is my saviour and my lord, as I keep on trying to remind myself and keep on saying, and our accountability to him, our responsibility to him, and stewardship of everything we've got, isn't it? But to that end, we need his grace, don't we? That to be strengthened with all might by his spirit in the inner man, we need his help to have the desire to live for him but to be completely for him because we pray that he'll revive the nation, he'll be at work but I feel that all it needs to be revive me we need it, we're so dependent on him really and to come back to that point I'd like to think that he just wasn't an interest inter pares amongst lots of things but that he is my reason for living that he's being saviour and lord that every department of our lives that he wants to be and deserves to be that's right he demands as our lord but he also deserves for all that he's done um, deserves that i should honor him in every department what do you want me to do where do you want me to go how do you want me to use my time how do you want me to use my money do you want me to empty all my resources and give it all to you or do you want me to do this that and the other but lord it's all yours as i am all yours do as you will with me and i would love to see us myself and if we could all get to that place all out for him all the time and I think if we could have gatherings um, where we would be helped and challenged afresh by remembering that God is God God is God and that uh, seems to be with me a lot